All right, everybody, one last session tonight on soul winning. Been going through the how-tos of soul winning in the sessions that I do. And so right now I want to talk about the closing and the wrap-up and praying with the people, assisting them to call upon the name of the Lord. So we've already started the conversation. We've already presented the gospel to them. We've already gone over eternal security in great detail and made sure that they understand that. So how do we transition from finishing up with the gospel into wrapping up and, and pulling the trigger, as it were, and, and leading them to the Lord and getting them to actually call upon the name of the Lord and seal the deal and get this thing of their salvation settled. Now, the way that I personally transition this is I just roll right from explaining eternal security into, okay, let me just ask you a few questions. And then I ask them questions in order to confirm that they understood everything that I said. Now, another thing that I'll often do at this point is after I explain eternal security, sometimes I'll say something like this. You know, when I got here, you mentioned that you weren't sure that you were going to heaven. And this is what I say. I say, you probably thought that, you know, I've done good, I've done bad, and you weren't really sure if you were good enough, but now you see that it's all by faith, right? Sometimes I'll throw that in there, and I'm going to get back to that in a little while, okay? But I'll kind of just throw something out there like that. Now you see that it's all by faith, and so I'll throw that out there just to kind of show them that what I've taught them is a little different than what they believe when I got there so that they see the difference, okay? Now, what are the questions that I use? I already covered this, but I'm just going to review it once again and I think it's important to really drive in this part about the closing because it's such an important part. So it, it bears repeating, okay? So anyway, I finished explaining eternal security and then I say to them, all right, let me just ask you a few questions, okay? First of all, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for all your sins? They should say yes. Okay, do you believe that Jesus rose again from the dead, that he physically walked out of the grave and showed them the holes in his hands? Yes. If Jesus were standing here right now and you were to ask him to save you, would he do it? And then how long would you be saved for? And of course, the answer should be forever. Is there anything you could do to mess that up? Nope, right? If they get all those questions right, that shows that they've followed along, they've comprehended and understood everything up to that point. And then at that point would be a good place if you like to throw in the thing about, hey, now when I got here, you weren't sure, but you were probably just thinking, you know, I've done good, I've done bad, but now you see that it's all through faith, it's all through Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. What I'd like to do before I go is just pray with you now and just help you tell God that that's what you believe. Obviously, Jesus is not literally standing here with us, but we know that if we pray, he hears us. So let me just help you right now, and you can just repeat after me. I'm just going to help you tell God that that's what you believe and just ask him to save you right now, okay? And then I just say, all right, let's bow our heads, and I pray with that person. Now, what is the prayer itself that I pray with that person? Well, my basic prayer that I would run through with people is something along the lines of, Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell, but I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again. Please save me right now. Give me eternal life. I'm only trusting you, Jesus. Amen. You know, that's the basic prayer that I usually run through with people. And I give it to them in small pieces so that it's not difficult for them to repeat. You know, like, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell, and they repeat, but I believe that you died on the cross for all my sins and rose again. Please save me right now and give me eternal life. I'm only trusting you, Jesus. Now, a lot of people will balk at this and say, oh, you're having people repeat a prayer. You know, you're one of these one, two, three, repeat after me. 
No, because I'm more like a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now let's repeat a prayer. Why? Because I'm actually being thorough and explaining the gospel well to the point where they understand. And you say, well, you know, if they're just repeating it, well, here's the thing. We already confirmed that they believe right about everything. That was the purpose of being thorough in the first place, watching their reaction, making sure they're understanding everything. Then at the end, during the wrap up, asking them important questions to figure out that they understand this. So if they believe right, why make them word their own prayer? That's what some people say. You need to make them pray on their own. But here's the thing, you're, you're making them uncomfortable. See, we've prayed so many thousands of times, it's easy for us to get up and pray. You know, if I called on any pastor in the room right now and said, hey, would you lead us in prayer? That would be a piece of cake for them, right? Because they prayed so many thousands and thousands of times, it's like second nature. But you don't want to just put somebody on the spot who's not even saved and just expect them to pray out loud publicly with you because you're embarrassing them, you're humiliating them, you're putting them in a weird position. There's no reason in the world why you can't just help them pray to the Lord and be saved. So what if you're just helping them and feeding them the words? It's not the words that save them. It's the believing in their heart and confessing with their mouth. In fact, there are times when I use a very simple prayer with people. Now you say, what situations would you do that? There are times when I'm talking to somebody who has a severe speech impediment. Like, I've been talking to someone who stuttered really bad, b b b badly before. And if I'm talking to somebody like that, I'm not going to make them pray some elaborate prayer and stutter through it. Why? Because that's embarrassing to them. You see, the difference between those of us who are teaching and believing and practicing good soul winning methods and those that scoff at these methods is that we actually love people. Yeah. And because we love people, we want to help them. And we don't want to humiliate them. We don't want to embarrass them. We're trying to make it easy for them. Why? Because we love them and we want them to get saved. You know, I think the best story I could use to illustrate this is I remember one time I was giving the gospel to my coworker. And because I kind of had a captive audience with this guy, I was training this guy, I was working with this guy, I was talking to him about the gospel throughout the day. So, I mean, I'd preach to this guy for hours. I mean, we're, we're driving in the work truck. I'm preaching to him. We're at work. And uh, then we went to dinner because we were out of town together. And then we stayed in the same hotel room. So we're down in the weight room of the hotel room. We lifted together and talked about the gospel as we lifted. So I'm preaching to him the gospel. He's kind of taking it all in, digesting it all. And he was interested in what I had to say. And so we get to the hotel room. We, we go to bed. Lights are out, we're laying in our beds, silence, and then he brings up the gospel to me again, Amen. which is great because that means he's, he's thinking about it. He's laying in bed thinking about the gospel. That's great, right? And so he, he asked me a couple questions from the bed, and I answered his questions, and then he flipped on the lights, and he sat on the edge of the bed, and he said, you know, this is something that I need to do. And he said, can you help me do this? Because I just need to know what do I do? Because, you know, how do I, I mean, I believe this. I want to be saved right now. Can you just help me do that? And I said, sure. And I led him in prayer and he received Christ as Savior. But, you know, I guess I should have said, no, you got to do this on your own, buddy. <laughs> I've been preaching to you all day. And if you can't figure out what else to do, I give up, buddy. You know, the guy wanted to be saved. The guy's ready to be saved. He's asking me to be, you know, at, it, the lights have gone out. We're, we're going to bed for the night. He flipped the light back on and he, he wants to get saved. Why? Because now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And to me, that's just a perfect illustration that people need help to get saved. You know, it's like the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I accept some man should guide me? Nothing wrong with helping people. Nothing wrong with reaching in and pulling people out of the fire. Now, I don't believe in praying with somebody who didn't understand the gospel, who doesn't comprehend what you've preached, who doesn't fully believe what you've preached. But once you've already confirmed that, what in the world reason is there not to pray with somebody once you're sure that they believe it and understand it? So <clears throat> I lead that person in prayer. And if they have a speech impediment, if they stutter, 
if they struggle with the, the, the pronunciation of words for whatever reason. I've led people in a very simple prayer, such as just, Dear Jesus, please save me. Amen. And that'll do it. I mean, why not? That's, that's, that's a better prayer than what the thief on the cross did. That makes more sense than what he said. So the point is that it's not the exact words that you use. It's just the fact that they're just calling out to the Lord by faith, right, that saves them. Now, let me talk about some, some problems that people have sometimes at this point. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you're going through the whole plan of salvation and you're getting to this point and people constantly don't want to pray with you, if you're constantly having that problem, there's probably something wrong with your soul winning. You're probably not being thorough enough up to this point, and it, you might be saying something weird or doing something weird at some point that's throwing people off. Because in my personal experience, being the talker and going soul winning with tons of other people as their silent partner, I just see over and over and over again getting to this point and people want to pray this prayer. I mean, when they understand the gospel and believe it, they want to pray that prayer. You don't have to force them or push them or talk them into it. They're ready to do it. So if you're just constantly running into an objection, everything's going great up to this point, and then you're constantly running into problems, you know, I would take another look at your soul winning methods. Maybe take a look at, at the soul winning demonstrations from some good soul winners. Maybe go out with some good soul winners and be a silent partner for a while and, and try to figure out where the disconnect is happening. But I will say this, there are going to be times where you run into a problem at this point. Like I said, if you're constantly running into problems, you may be the problem. Okay, you may need to tweak your methods a little bit and, and get a little better at this. Okay, but there are going to be times when you do run into a problem at this point. So let me just explain to you how I handle some of those situations. Sometimes I'll get to that point where it's like, okay, I'm just going to pray with you right now and I'm going to help you tell God that that's what you believe. You can just make sure right now that you're going to heaven, ask Christ to save you right now. Usually it's just great, 9 out of 10. Okay. But sometimes you'll get the person that says, oh, I've already done that. Right? Who's ever run into that before? Like, yeah, that's pretty common where they'll just say, oh, I've already done that. Well, at this point, what I do is I explain to them that, well, it's not praying that prayer that saves you. It's that you have to believe on Christ and fully trust him. And when I got here, you were thinking, you know, that your good outweighed your bad, or you were thinking, I hope so. You were thinking that it had something to do with your works. Now you see it's all by faith. Now you're ready to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay, because in Romans 10, 13, it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? So now that we've got you believing in Christ for your salvation instead of believing in yourself and in your works, you know, now you're ready to call upon the name of the Lord. So that's how I deal with that objection. If they still object and say, no, 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 I don't need to do this again. I've already done it. Then, then just walk away at that point. Then you walk away. I mean, what else can you do at that point? You know, obviously they're missing something here. So that's how I would explain it to that person if they uh, got to that. Now, some people will tell you when you get to the end, a slight variation on that. Oh, well, I already believed all that before you got here. But you know that when you got there and you asked them the question, they gave you a totally wrong answer. They said, live a good life, go to church, keep the commandments. And now all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, I already knew all that. I already knew that it was all by faith. I already knew that. Well, you know, what do you do at that point? At that point, I would just gently and kindly mention to them, well, you know, when I got here, you said it was X, Y, and Z, but I, I think now you see that it's just all by faith. So I do it nicely. I don't just go like, well, you said it the other way. <laughs> you know, you want to be nice to people. So I, I, I kind of explain to people in a gentle way by saying, you know, actually, when I got here, you had said live a good life, go to church, but I think now you see, though, now you see that it's all by faith now. And, you know, that way they can just say, yeah, that's right. But if they just go, no, 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 you misunderstood me. I mean, I've always known it was by faith. I've always known, you know, 
What do you do at that point is you walk away. You just go, oh, okay, all right, great. I mean, you can't just sit there and just keep calling. Look, you're lying to me, buddy. Well, what's that going to accomplish? So if the person just says, no, 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 I already believed all this. I already knew all this. Then at that point, I just go, okay, well, well, great. I believe the same thing. So, and then I just roll right into just inviting them to church. You know, and I don't, I don't worry too much about that. Now, let me stop and address something here that I, I see a lot. I see this a lot at Faithful Word Baptist Church. I see this a lot everywhere I go. And I keep preaching about it, and a lot of people don't listen to me, but I'm going to say it again. <laughs> Is that there are a lot of soul winners that I go with. They feel like they have to force people to admit that they weren't saved yesterday or that they weren't saved, that they were for sure going to hell before you got there. They feel like they have to force that issue. And I think this is where a lot of these problems come from, is that there, the, a lot of this issue is actually created by the soul winner who just wants to really badger them or really push this issue or really force them to admit, I wasn't saved yesterday. Now, I personally find that step to be completely unnecessary, and you're just kind of picking a confrontation with people and just uh, making people uncomfortable. I just don't see the point. So this is what I do differently than that, okay? When I talk to the people about what they used to believe versus what they believe now, I don't ask them. I tell them. Because when I got there, I asked them the questions. They gave me all the wrong answers, so I already know where they were at spiritually. So I don't ask them, so is this different than what you used to believe? I just tell them, I, I just, and I do it nicely. I, you know, I tell them, hey, when I got here, you said you weren't sure because you were thinking this. And when I, whenever I say that, and I've said this to hundreds of people, hey, when I got here, you said you weren't sure because you were thinking I've done good, I've done bad, and you're wondering if you're good enough. Nine out of ten people, when I say that, just go, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. But now you see it's all by faith. Yep, that's right. Okay, well, let's pray. And then they pray with me and they get saved and everybody's happy and everybody goes home <laughs> smiling and saved and on their way to heaven. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. I don't sit there and say, okay, well, now let me ask you this. What if you would have died a half hour ago? Would you have split hell wide open then? <laughs> what about yesterday? You would have burned in hell. Aren't you glad I showed up? <laughs> you know, I, I don't see why you have to say that or, or why you need to prove that. Now, let me give you an illustration about this that's a perfect illustration. Okay. There was a guy at our church who was a dedicated, longtime church member at Faithful Word Baptist Church. There wasn't any question about this guy's salvation. He's a strong Christian, a soul winner, great guy. Well, when I first met this guy, it was outside of church, and it was before he'd ever been to church, and I met him in a social situation, and I talked to him and asked him the questions, and he gave me the wrong answers. He was clearly not safe. So I ended up talking to him about the gospel a little bit, but because we were in a, a social setting, I wasn't able to go into it in full detail. But I gave him some scriptures, I preached him the gospel, and he did not receive what I had to say. He didn't agree with what I said about salvation being by faith, right? Well, a week later, he showed up to church. And when he came to church, someone else approached him, went over the gospel with him. He gave them the wrong answers, right? But after coming to church two, three times, he ended up getting saved, okay? After hearing the gospel a couple times, because a lot of people have to hear it a few times. He heard the gospel a few times, and then he got baptized at our church, and then he became a dedicated church member. Well, six months later, I talked to this guy, and he said, you know, I think I was actually saved before I came to Faith Ward, because a couple months before I went there, I went down the aisle in a Baptist church and I prayed and received Christ as Savior. I'm pretty sure that's when I got saved. And I said to this guy, I said, well, no, because I'm the one who talked to you and you definitely gave me the wrong answer. I mean, you thought you could lose your salvation. You thought you had to repent of your sins. You didn't, you didn't believe that it was by faith alone. You know, you thought that you had to do your own part. And he said, no, no. He said, I think I was just a little confused. I, I, I think it was more like I was just not doctrinally nailed down, and I was just a little bit mixed up, and I was just kind of 
doubtful on those things. I don't think I just told you that you could lose it or that, you know, it was these other things. I think I was just, you know, didn't, didn't know as much. And I'm like, no, you weren't saved when you got here. You know. <laughs> but this guy just, you know, six months later, a year later, as memories fade, this guy just kind of had it in his head that he'd actually gotten saved a couple months before that. But here's the way I look at it. Who cares? Because you know what? The evidence that he's saved right now is that he believes right now. He believes the gospel. He prayed with them, and then he prayed with us. Then he got baptized. You know, it didn't really matter because either way, he got baptized after salvation. Now, I have no doubt that he didn't get saved until he came to our church. I have no doubt. But I didn't feel the need to, to badger him and force the issue and be like, hey, listen, buddy. I'm starting to doubt you're even saved because you're claiming that you were already saved before we got you saved. What's the deal? You know, and, and, and here's an illustration of that. You know, sometimes when we're on the Navajo reservation in Arizona, there are people who don't know their birthday and don't know how old they are. Now, that's hard for us to understand because we really make a big deal about our birthday and we look at the calendar and we all know the date and the day of the week. But a lot of these Indians, they're part of a different culture. They don't think about those kind of things. So there's a lady that I know on the reservation. And the only reason that she knows that her birthday is December 26th is because it was the day after Christmas. So that stood out in everybody's mind. And she's either 89 or 92. And she doesn't know. But they know she's either 89 or 92. But they just keep getting mixed up which year exactly she was born. And I told her she didn't look a day over 89. So... <laughs> But the point is that the way that we know that she's born is that we're looking at her. There's no question about whether or not she was born. And we don't have to know when she was born to know that she was born. The fact that she's here is the evidence that she was born, whether that was 89 years ago or 92 years ago. And the evidence that people are saved is that they believe right. They believe right on the gospel. Because whosoever believeth should not perish but have eternal life. Amen. And he that believeth on Christ has everlasting life. Okay? So we don't have to know the exact date and time that they did that. Now, you know, a lot of people know that date and time. Now, I know that I received Christ as Savior when I was six years old. I couldn't tell you the date. I couldn't tell you the day of the week. I could tell you the story and the circumstances. I definitely remember it clearly, but I never marked a calendar. I did it Navajo reservation style where I just forgot that date, okay, when I was born again. But does that prevent me from having been saved? No, because it doesn't really matter when I think I was saved. God knows when I got saved. So if somebody thinks to themselves, hey, I think I was already saved because I already believed in Jesus, if they, does that mean that they're not saved? if they think that they got saved some other time, I don't think that, that has anything to do with it. You know what determines whether that person's saved or not is whether they're trusting Jesus Christ as their savior right now and whether they believe the record that God gave of his son right now. If somebody believes that record right now and calls upon the name of the Lord with me right now, God is gonna answer that prayer when they call out to him for salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if they have believed in him and called upon him, they shall be saved. Now, if they think, well, I think I might have already been saved. I'm, and a lot of people, they're just not sure. They're thinking, you know, I may have already been saved, but let's make sure right now. Now, me, okay, as someone who knows the Bible a lot better than they do since I've been saved for 20 or 30, I've been saved for 30 years now. You know, if I've been saved for 30 years and they've been saved for 30 seconds, <laughs> who do you think knows more doctrine? Who do you think knows more about the Bible? So I might be able to look at that person and say, well, I know for sure they weren't saved before, but that now they are. They may think to themselves, you know, I may have already been saved, but now I know for sure. So what? That's where I stand on this. So I, I don't feel the need to force the issue of, well, what if you would have died yesterday? Would you have gone to hell yesterday? They might not know the answer to that question. They may not be convinced of that because they may think, well, you said all I have to do is believe in Jesus, and I did believe in Jesus before, so maybe I was okay. 
who cares? At that point, I think it's getting into a little vein jangling, in my opinion. So again, a lot of people, I say that till I'm blue in the face. They don't listen. They want to just keep badgering people about that. Well, you know, go ahead and badger people about that, but I'm not going to because I don't think it's relevant. And I think that that's where a lot of people run into issues is by forcing an issue that really isn't relevant. What, what's my goal when I'm soul winning? What's my goal in this wrap-up? I'll tell you exactly what my goal is. Because it's important that we understand why we do the things we do. My goal in this wrap-up is to make sure they've understood the gospel, right? And then assist them in calling upon the name of the Lord. You know why? Because I know for a fact that if they believe the true gospel of Jesus Christ and they call on the Lord, that they will be saved. Period. Because anybody who understands and believes the gospel and calls upon the name of the Lord is going to be saved. That's the promise of God. So anything beyond that, I'm not interested. That's what I'm trying to do with this wrap-up. Okay. Now, what if people, and, and this happens very rarely again, sometimes people will say, well, I thought all you said I have to do is just believe. Why do I have to pray now? Look, it's literally one in a hundred people that say that to me. That virtually never comes up. If that comes up, then I just take them to Romans 10.9 and Romans 10.13 and just show them those verses. Now, a lot of people, Romans 10.9 and 13 are how they end their gospel presentation. And I think Romans 10.9 and 13 is a great place to end your gospel presentation. I usually don't turn to those scriptures. I usually just, you know, uh, hammer all the verses on believe and eternal life. And then I just lead them in prayer to call upon the name of the Lord. That's, that's my method that I do. But... Romans 10, 9, and 13 are great verses to point people to. And then you can show them verse 10 as well. And let me just quote those for you in case you don't know them. Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm not going to go into a big dissertation tonight on why calling upon the name of the Lord goes hand in hand with believing on Christ and being saved. I've done many sermons like that. Brother Jimenez touched on it in his sermon tonight, but I'm assuming that all of you believe that or already know that. If you don't, that's another sermon to listen to, sermons on calling upon the name of the Lord, calling upon God Almighty, different sermons I've preached, the sinner's prayer, you know, it's, it's a doctrine that's very easy to prove throughout the Bible. But again, it's, it's not something that I find coming up when I'm out soul winning. It's rarely an issue when I go soul winning. It's more like navel-gazing Baptist church members that dream up this stuff like, oh, calling upon the name of the Lord, that's works. You know, that doesn't come out of people's mouth when I'm preaching the gospel at the door. It usually is just some strange doctrine that people come up with in churches when they're just navel-gazing. And, and what do I mean by that? Uh, asking for something isn't working for it. I guess everybody who goes and asks for their welfare check worked for it. <laughs> Give me my welfare check. Oh, you just earned it. In no other area of life would we consider asking for something working for it. You know, the Bible says, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it was that said unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. If you ask for a gift, it's still a gift. It doesn't mean you earned it or paid for it or worked for it. And again, that's a whole other sermon in of itself. Okay, so after I've prayed with the people, what do I do next, right? I just finished the prayer. I said, you know, I'm only trusting you, Jesus. Amen. What do I do next? We, we, our eyes are closed. We open our eyes. We look up. What do I say next? How do you feel? No, that's a horrible thing to say. It's a horrible thing to say. That is the worst possible thing that you could say. All right? Because it's not about feelings and religious experiences. Okay. This is what I... Now, now here's another thing that you shouldn't say. Did you mean that? Because if I... Just by the way I said that just now, did you mean that? You know what? It's automatically like putting doubt in their mind, like... Did you mean that? Are you sure you meant that? Because then I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Did I? You know, I thought I did. I thought I did until you looked at me and asked me in that voice. So here's what I say. 
And keep in mind, I've already been thorough up to this point. I say, hey, you meant that, didn't you? Then you know what? The Bible says you're on your way to heaven. Why? If you were to die right now, where would you go? Heaven. Why would you go there? Because I believe. Is there anything you do to lose it? Nope, man, isn't that great news? Okay, so I want to confirm them and give them assurance. I don't want to put doubt in their mind by asking them how they feel. And then they're like, I don't know, I didn't tingle. What do I, you know, is, I don't know if it worked. Okay? Or, or you know, uh, did you mean that? Because then it's like, well, I, don't, I don't know, you know, what? I hope so. I thought I did. So we don't want to put doubt in their mind. We want to give them assurance because we've already been thorough up to this point. We already have supreme confidence that they believed what they just said or else we wouldn't have prayed with them in the first place. Okay, so then after I give them a little assurance, not doubt, then I want to leave them with something to help them grow as a Christian. I want to leave them with a New Testament or a full Bible, or I want to leave them with some kind of a DVD or a preaching CD or something where they can learn more, or hopefully all of the above. Hopefully I can give them a New Testament, I can give them a preaching CD, a DVD, now, I like to give people the New Testament just because the, the whole Bible can sometimes be a little overwhelming to people. It's so big. And the way I see it is, you know, read the New Testament and then we'll talk. You know, I mean, the New Testament is a big job for people to read if they're not used to it anyway. And I usually like to even open the, the Bible and start them and say, hey, look, here's where I want you to start reading. And I usually start them in John chapter 1. And I put a bookmark in John 1 and I say, hey, listen, this is where I want you to start reading John. And then what I do is I take my Bible and I show them the book of John and I say this. I say, look, this is how long the book of John is. I said, see the whole Bible? It's a long book, right? Here's the book of John. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to decide right now that you're going to read the whole book of John before you quit. Because I told them that the Bible can be a little bit hard to read if you're not used to it. Maybe you're not used to reading a lot, or maybe the language is a little bit harder than what you're used to. But I said, if you keep reading, you'll get used to it. You'll really like it. You'll get into the story. And I say, just make a commit. I say, is this a lot? And they say, no, that's not a lot. Just, I want you to decide right now that you're not going to quit until you finish the book of John. Because I believe that if you can finish the book of John, you'll want to keep going. You'll roll right into Acts. You'll roll. I mean, if you read the whole book of John, you're going to want to keep reading. You're going to want to roll into the book of Acts. So I tell them, don't quit after one chapter. Don't quit after two chapters. You know, get through the book of John. Is that a lot that I'm asking you to do? No, it's not. And they're like, no, no, I can do that. So, it's, you know, it's just giving them an attainable goal of finishing the book of John. And then I tell them, go to the table of contents. And when you finish John, check it off. And then when you finish the next book, check it off. That way you can read whatever book you want, but make sure you check them off so that eventually you can read the whole Bible. I don't tell them to read it in order because I don't want them to get bogged down in numbers and Deuteronomy. I'd rather that they read what they want to read and just keep track of it. So I, I show them some things about reading the Bible. I leave them with a CD, leave them with a DVD, leave them with whatever materials I can, and then I invite them to church, and I show them the service times, the location, and I tell them, hey, when you come there, you know me, you know him, and you can find us when you get there, and you know, you already know a couple people, you got a couple friends there, and so on, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, but the main thing that I want to emphasize here about the wrap-up is that your goal is to help people. You love people. You want them to be saved. So you want to do the best job you can to get them across the finish line and get them to Jesus, pull them out of the fire, get them saved. You've already done a thorough job of preaching the gospel. Help them to make that final decision and pull the trigger. And then once they get saved, give them a next step to take of reading the Bible, and getting in church. You say, well, what about the discipleship and follow-up? Well, the discipleship takes place on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. <laughs> right? Those are the discipleship classes. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the, the great day that we've had today, the many, many people that were saved out on soul winning. And Lord, I just pray that you would uh, use this conference and the lives of the people that are here to motivate them and also just to educate them and help them to do a better job at soul winning, Lord. I, I pray that people would go out of here with their sword a little bit sharper than it was and their, their sickle a little bit sharper that they might go out and reap the great harvest that's waiting for us outside these doors. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.